I think most people in the room are probably aware that we're in the midst of a revolution in how we think about and treat cancer. And that instead of worrying about the tissue of origin or the way the cells look in the microscope, uh, increasingly tumors are being defined by the spectrum of oncogene mutations and tumor suppressant mutations that they have. Uh, and really, this was not a field that Sequinome wanted to be involved in. We're a small company and cancer is a gigantic field, but we've been dragged into this uh, by customer demand because uh, I think, as you'll see, our platform uh, meets a number of the needs, at least currently, uh, that are present in this field. Um, so what I'm going to do this afternoon is remind any of you who are not aware that we use mass spectrometry and then encourage you to forget about that. Uh, and then I'm going to show you uh, some um, old and some relatively new results on looking at somatic mutations in solid tumors. And I'll conclude by showing you some results that were just published a few weeks ago on looking at BCR able mutations in uh, CML in leukemia. Now, what makes me potentially excited about this field is the thought that we may be able to do these measurements someday non-invasively. We may be able to find these mutations that define tumors without having to have a sample of the tumor. That's not the case today. And it's not the case in any of the examples I'm going to show you. But I actually believe we're very close, as I think you'll see by the last example I'm going to show you. So we're measuring mutations. And uh, how hard that is, oops, sorry, depends on how pure they are. So if I've just got a germline, uh, germline single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, the way I think about this, the allele frequencies are quantized. There are only three possible correct answers. And um, you know, as in the classical genetics that most of us learn in school. Uh, but human genetics is more complicated than that simple germline. And for many genes, we have to worry about copy number variants. And even if there are just two copies, uh, then the allele frequencies uh, can uh, uh, occupy a denser spectrum of results, as you can see. And if there are more copies, and some human genes are present in 14 copies, uh, then uh, <laughs> allele frequencies of clinical and genetic significance can be very small. It's almost like you're in a 16-ploid strawberry. But those are pure samples. Those are still germline samples. And when we have to confront uh, somatic tissue, either because of somatic mutations or epigenetic modifications, or if we're looking at mixed samples like uh, DNA and plasma, clinically significant allele frequencies can be 1% or less. And these are very demanding to measure. But they can be measured. So just to remind any of you who are not aware, uh, we do use mass spectrometry to look at uh, mutations or polymorphisms. We do a multiplex single tube PCR amplification in most cases. And any of you who heard Mike Phillips talk this morning realize that he's designing assays at 45 plex. Okay, so you can cover a lot of space in the genome in a single microtiter plate well. These amplicons are sequenced, usually by single base sequencing, occasionally by something more complex. And it's the sequencing products that we fly into the mass spectrometer. And this is uh, very quantitative and, as you'll see, very sensitive. But it's not a de novo sequencing method. You have to more or less know in advance what you're looking for. Here's the mass, mass spectrometry I want you to forget. Uh, if you think of this as electrophoresis, it's more or less correct. It happens to be in vacuum, but it's electrophoresis. Uh, it's automated, so you don't really need to ever know much about it, and it uh, can handle easily 300 samples, sorry, 3,000 samples a day, which is far too much for most diagnostic settings, but it's better to have too much capacity than too little. This is everything you need to know about nucleic acid mass spectrometry, because we only measure molecular ions. And therefore, any peak in a nucleic acid mass spectrum has to be a simple linear combination of these four masses. 
And so everything can be predicted in advance, everything can be analyzed with full automation. So all you need to do is choose the samples and design the assays, which the software does for you, and uh, analyze the results. So if you had a biallelic system, which is the simplest case we would want to consider, and it's uh, heterozygous, as this example shows, then the PCR will give you two amplicons, and the sequencing reaction will give you two extension products, and uh, the uh, expected products will differ by a known mass in advance. But what's different between this kind of mass spectrometry and any other kind of mass spectrometry that you may be used to is that the area under these peaks represents the concentration of analyte in the original sample with tremendous fidelity. Typical standard deviation is 1%. Okay? So this is actually the most accurate method we have to measure the concentration of single loci. And you can do this in a number of ways depending on the complexity of the situation. So if, for example, on the left, you have a heterozygote and the two peaks are not equal in uh, area, th then you know something complicated is going on. Either you have a copy number situation or you have some kind of, oops, uh, is this going to keep doing it? Allele dropout or allele amplification. If you want to quantify the absolute concentration of analyte in the sample, you can add an internal standard and um, uh, uh, reference the uh, peak that corresponds to the natural analyte with the peak that corresponds to the internal standard. And since in advance you know uh, what the internal standard represents because you added it to the sample, then from the ratio between the uh, sequencing peak from the internal standard and a different sequencing peaks from your analyte, you get the absolute concentration. And if you have a biallelic system, you can add a third allele to the sample and uh, from the uh, artificial allele ratio to the two natural alleles, you get the uh, absolute concentration of the two uh, natural analytes. So uh, I always like to show this slide by Mike Phillips, but I'm going to have to replace it with a newer one <laughs> because he's now gone in, in clinically useful assay, assays up from 32 plex to, to 45 plex. Okay. But this is germline genotyping. It's really easy, the alleles are strong, and you pretty much know the expected intensity ratios in advance. When you start to work with somatic tissues, like tumor, as I already mentioned, uh, things become more complex. And we were drawn into this field when this paper was published by, by many well-known investigators, uh, largely centered at the Dana-Farber and the Broad Institute, uh, looking at a large cohort of uh, tumor samples uh, for the presence of known oncogene mutations. So in this first study, they looked at 238 known mutations in 17 oncogenes uh, that uh, form part of the signaling pathways which um, define the properties, the addictive properties of, of many uh, uh, tumors. And the purpose was to see if some of the drugs like Gleevec and Eressa that have been approved for rare tumor indications and address specific mutations in these pathways, they wanted to see if some of these drugs could be used on more common tumors. Now what makes this difficult is the heterogeneity of tumors. And so here, for example, uh, from that original publication is uh, lung cancer biopsy. This is all being done on biopsies. In, uh, and it's an EGFR mutation that uh, is presenting fractionally. So here in this raw data is the sequencing primer, the wild type allele, the mutant allele. And the peak is small, but you can see, uh, especially it's m more visible on the slide than it is on this computer, you can see that the peak falls exactly where um, uh, the software expects for that particular sequence. So you could, and this is the raw signal to noise, so you can be pretty confident that this peak is real and not just noise. So in that first study, they, they looked at um, 238 mutations and 1,000 uh, human tumor samples representing different types of preparations and 17 types of cancer. 
And the results were very impressive because 30% of all of those tumors had a mutation which was known in advance to be involved in cancer and in many cases was, oops, sorry, was uh, clinically actionable. Um, but that was four years ago. Okay. So now we have about 850 known oncogene mutations uh, which are potentially addressable in the clinic. And although nobody is, knows for sure, estimates that I've heard suggest that this discovery will eventually saturate out at you know, around uh, 1,500 or 2,000 driver mutations, uh, which uh, some of which or, or many of which will eventually be uh, addressable uh, pharmacologically. So this field is moving very fast and it's impossible to keep up. But a year ago, this was the list, as reviewed uh, by Tim Harris at NCI, of FDA-approved individualized uh, uh, medications that could be used to address oncogene mutations in a whole bunch of oncogenes. And there are already uh, several more uh, very, very potent drugs that have uh, achieved FDA approval since this. Okay? So the good news is you can make these measurements on a patient sample and in some cases choose a rational therapy, which uh, in occasional instances is absolutely remarkable in its impact. The bad news is that it's complicated. And it's not going to get simpler. It's only going to get more complicated because there are lots of genes and lots of mutations playing a role. And to show you this just for the EGFR pathway, what I've done is to take a, a, a slide from a review article and uh, amend it to show you which members of the EGFR signaling pathway are targets for currently uh, approved uh, drugs and uh, which um, uh, genes in this pathway have uh, known somatic mutations uh, that can affect the pathway. And you can see that to characterize this one pathway requires measuring more than 200 known mutations and uh, thinking about, uh, I think it's five now, different FDA-approved drugs, okay? So it's not simple, but it's doable. So at Sequenome, driven by customer demand, uh, we've been producing, we call them panels because they're for research use only, but basically we agent sets that allow you to measure uh, the mutations that were the subject of the original uh, 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 Dana-Farber study, slightly modified mutations that uh, were of interest to Brian Drucker and others at Oregon Health Sciences University for leukemia, more Dana-Farber reflective mutations, uh, a specialized panel for uh, melanoma, and there are several more panels in, in the works, including, if I get it right, one for lung cancer, maybe one for colon cancer, one for uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, and so on. Uh, these are genuinely useful in the clinic because they often pick up rare mutations that you don't expect that are actionable. And here's an example of uh, 271 uh, metastatic melanoma samples where a MEK mutant appeared in one sample. Well, it's rare, but for that patient, uh, you can do something. The problem is that these complex panels of mutations are not going to be easily handled in a community hospital where most cancer is treated, both because of the complexity of making the measurements and especially because the complexity of interpreting this huge mass of data. Okay? So what many investigators have been doing is trying to focus these large panels down in specific clinical presentations. And I just picked one of many publications in the last few years. This one is from the University of Pittsburgh, and it's in colon cancer. So they took the first of these Oncocarta panels and um, uh, almost an identical number of archival samples. Everything I'm showing you works on archival samples. And found that only a subset of the genes uh, had mutations in these colon cancer archival samples, and most of the mutations of interest were in three genes. Here's an example for, of a clinically actionable PIK3CA mutation uh, in that archival sample present at uh, 5%. Small peak, all right, but it's there. Okay. And uh, they were very happy when they compared a, made a reduced panel, which would only require two microtider plates to run. Uh, and, and reduce the cost by roughly a factor of 10 that they got full concordance. Uh, 
with the original panel. But once again, this is invasive. Okay? So the question is, how do we move this from measurements that require a biopsy to measurements that don't require a biopsy? Because for screening, for uh, following therapeutic response, recurrence, and so on, you can't keep doing biopsies. And if you think about the problem, if a clinically actionable mutation, like that PIK3CA, is present at 5% in a so-called pure sample of the tumor, then if I were to try to look for that mutation, let's say in the circulation, or in some other sample, which I can get non-invasively, but which is compromised by host contamination, I'm going to have sensitivity far in excess of 5% in order to be able to see non-invasively these same mutations. Okay? So how do I up the sensitivity of these assays? And the answer is, there are many different ways of doing it, and most of them unfortunately are not user-friendly. So we've tried many of these methods, preferential isolation as in CTCs, preferential amplification as in uh, allele-specific amplification, and preferential detection and so on. And frankly, you can optimize any one of these procedures for one or two mutations. But if you want to handle tens or hundreds of mutations, and if you want to handle those in multiplex, so you can make a few measurements and not have to make hundreds of independent measurements, this becomes challenging. And although we still are working on other methods, right now the one method which is working well for increasing the sensitivity is a very simple mass spec trick, which we call Sabre. Okay. I love mass spec, but its limitation is dynamic range. It's very hard for a mass spec to see a small peak that's next to a very big peak. Okay. Our very big peaks are wild type, and, our, and they're not interesting. We don't want to see them. And our small peaks are mutants. Okay. So the way to improve the dynamic range of mass spectrometry is to leave out the sequencing substrates that generate the large peaks, which we can do because we know what the sequence is. So now we generate spectra that will only contain mutant peaks if there are any, and as you'll see momentarily, that increases the sensitivity uh, quite substantially. So the results I'm going to show you in the last uh, five minutes or so of the talk um, were published three weeks ago uh, as a collaboration between uh, the Cancer Center in Adelaide, Australia, and uh, Daryl Irwin of uh, Sequinome. And this is an actual clinical trial of 220 patients who have chronic myeloid leukemia uh, and are being treated with the drug of first choice, uh, imatinib, one of these personalized medications. Okay. And you probably know, but just to remind you, that CML is caused by a chromosome, a chromosome translocation that activates a fusion product of the genes BCR and ABL. So it's producing constitutively a kinase that it shouldn't produce, right? Okay? And um, the problem with these leukemias is that uh, they start out sensitive to imatinib, but because the, the tumors have a mutator phenotype, Eventually, they spin off mutations which are resistant to the drug of first choice. And so the clinical challenge is then to figure out, well, what do I do for this patient who is starting cytologically to show failure to my drug? Uh, you know, do I have another drug I can switch to? Or is it going to be a hopeless case because I have nothing else to switch to? So the design of this clinical trial was to uh, act switchover, which is when uh, cytologically you see the first signs of failure, to try to see if there are mutations in the uh, bcr able kinase uh, transcript. Uh, and uh, uh, so they attempted to do this by mass spectrometry and in parallel by sequencing. And because we're starting with an RNA instead of a DNA, of course, we use reverse transcription to make a DNA, and then everything follows. Okay. And it turns out that the mass spec, if there were mutations, the mass spec found them right at switchover. So there was no reason to repeat the measurements. Sequencing, as you'll see, misses most of them at switchover. And so you have to keep repeating the sequencing. And eventually, the mutants usually show up 
Again, I wish it was simple. <laughs> it's not simple. These are all the currently known mutations which um, yield cells that are resistant to imatinib, uh, the drug of first choice. And uh, because we have to leave out one of the substrates, we have to divide these mutations into four different multiplexes, each one of which is missing one uh, uh, substrate. And as you can see, the, they, these assays are still, in some cases, at 10plex. So some of these mutations are not clinically actionable, the ones in black. But the ones in green are resistant to nilotinib, and so those patients could be switched to dasatinib. And some of them are resistant to dasatinib in red, so they can be switched to nilotinib. And unfortunately, there's one mutation which is quite common, which is resistant to both second-line drugs. So for those patients, uh, you really can do nothing. Um, these are spike in experiments reported in this publication to show the sensitivity of some of these assays for mutations. And the one on the right, uh, you can see that uh, there's pretty good distinction between negative controls and a mutation spiked in at uh, uh, half a percent, so one in 200. And of course, if it's more prevalent, then the signal is stronger. The one on the left is tremendously sensitive. Uh, you can see compared to negative controls that even one in uh, uh, 0.05 percent, uh, one, in, one in 2,000 is uh, readily observable, and one in 500 is a piece of cake. Okay? So they have to look at 23 different mutations in these four multiplexes, and you can see that the worst sensitivity is one in 200. The average sensitivity is about one in 500. So this is awfully good. Now whether this is good enough to do somatic mutations in the circulation remains to be seen. But this is now a factor of 10 better than uh, what we've had before. And, and uh, as you can see, it's scalable to uh, multiplexes and, and uh, lots of mutations. And in just a couple of slides, let me show you that these kinds of measurements really help patients and clinicians. So above the horizontal line are the mutations which are clinically actionable. And in blue are the mutations which can be seen uh, by sequencing or by mass spec, either way, at switchover. And uh, those are the blue ones. And the yellow ones can only be seen by mass spec. So what this shows you is that roughly some 60% of the mutations uh, can only be seen by mass spec at switchover. And so if you want to have the quickest change in therapeutic uh, regimen, you have to do this by mass spec. Uh, if we dig down more closely to the uh, therapeutically actionable mutations, you can see that uh, some of these patients, either by sequencing and mass spec or only mass spec, some of them uh, have mutations that uh, unfortunately are resistant to both second line drugs. So there's nothing you can do uh, for these patients, but uh, an equal number or a slightly greater, actually a greater number, uh, have differential resistance at this point to dasatinib or nilotinib, so you can make a rational choice of therapy and put them on the right drug. So this kind of stuff is really useful. Um, for some of the positive mutations, uh, they, oops, they basically uh, could, re, they could, in single plex, of course, not in multiplex, they could confirm some of these results with allele-specific PCR. Uh, and they would eventually see this mutation by sequencing, but you can see for some of these patients, it took up to 10 months before they could see the mutation by conventional sequencing. And if whatever these drugs cost, $5,000 a month, that's an awful lot of wasted healthcare <laughs> before you uh, notice which uh, drugs. Uh, when you finally see the results by sequencing and mass spectrometry, the concordance is nearly perfect, as you can see, one, one discordant sample in, in uh, 300. So let me leave you with the following thought. There's really synergy between mass spectrometry and second generation sequencing here. Okay? Because mass spectrometry is not a discovery tool. Okay? Now, if you want to do sequencing as a discovery tool, and it is the best discovery tool today, you have to decide which samples to sequence. And it's really a good idea to start by profiling samples before you sequence them with mass spectrometry. 
because it gives you a whole bunch of positive controls, mutations that are present. And so if the sequencing doesn't find those mutations, something's wrong with the sequencing. The sequencing will find other mutations because it can find mutations that you don't know about in advance. And once you find them, uh, it's a good idea since current sequencing is very high throughput but rather error prone to confirm those mutations by mass spectrometry. And as I've shown you, for mature small panels up to you know, 100, 200 mutations, mass spec is working really well in the clinic for um, detecting these mutations. But if you, if you had to do a 1,000 or 2,000 gene panel, I, I think we'd probably all agree. You, you'd, you'd have to do that by sequencing because the workflow from mass spec would become too complicated. So that's the story I wanted to tell you, and I hope we have some questions. Thank you.